coming up, the truth about water injection in internal combustion engines, plus an Easter safe driving message like no other, and a special guest appearance in that by the Messiah. So that's nice. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Stria new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Question. On some jet engines, there is an installation that is used for spraying water into the air intake for greater thrust during takeoff, usually when the airplane is loaded rather heavily. What is the reason for it working? Is it the energy released from the water splitting and burning up alongside the jet fuel or a greater expansion of water when turning from liquid to gas state than the fuel has? Water injection is not a scam, okay? It absolutely does work for internal combustion engines. But comments like this, they really make me wonder if anyone pays attention during science classes, frankly. Is the energy released from water splitting and burning up alongside jet fuel? When I read that, I despair for the future of humanity. Water cannot split up and burn, okay, in an engine or anywhere else. When your friggin' house is on fire and the fire brigade arrives, they spray water onto your house specifically because the water cannot burn anymore. Water is already burnt. Water is not a fuel, okay? It's exhaust. Anything you can burn containing carbon and hydrogen, anything at all, gasoline, diesel, coal, wood, paper, whatever, one of the combustion byproducts is water. And yet, water injection can yield a power gain in an internal combustion engine. See, to a scientist or an engineer, water is a pretty amazing material. It really is the Swiss army knife of thermal shock absorption. It's brilliant for removing heat and transporting it elsewhere. We sweat, right? Because evaporative cooling is an incredibly efficient mechanism for maintaining your body's core temperature. A small amount of water evaporating over your skin absorbs an incredible amount of heat and it stops you overheating. The dark side of which is if you get yourself wet in the bush and it's cold and there's a big wind blowing and you can't get dry or into shelter, evaporative cooling is powerful enough to kill you. Just to put some numbers on this, all right? When liquid water absorbs heat, it pulls 4.2 kilojoules of heat out of the environment for every kilo that rises just one degree C. And when it changes phase, it jumps from a liquid to a vapor, it absorbs 2.3 million joules for every kilo. And a kilo of water is a litre, more or less, depending on the temperature, which is a bit over 1.5 imperial pints if you're not from around here. Water methanol injection is the answer for direct injection intake valve buildup. It will wash the intake valve just like the fuel used to do in port injection. But you get added effects from the water of steam cleaning. This is the best solution in my opinion. Water really is a heavyweight champion at evaporative cooling. The alcohols like ethanol and methanol, they're only about half as good there and petrol is only only about one-tenth as good as water at evaporative cooling. And honestly, I think you'd have to inject rather a lot of methanol for it to have any significant positive combustion effects like anti-knock properties, which is another common suggestion I get in the comments feed. So on this intake valve thing, you know, this problem of gumming up with direct injection is grossly overstated. There's no epidemic of gummed up inlet valves out there en masse, right? Water injection could potentially help the proportionally small number of engines that experience this. But even then, you're really only treating the symptom and not the root cause of the problem, which is far more likely to be a defective EGR or PCV system on the vehicle. Anyway, if you can use air to supply the heat to warm up the water and evaporate it, the air loses the heat that the water gains, okay, and the air gets colder as a result, so it shrinks. So the same mass of air is going to take up less space. 
And that's pretty good because there's a finite amount of space inside your engine and getting more air in there is going to mean that you can burn more fuel and that means you can make more power and that means you can go faster than the other guy and in a competition. It's always kind of nice, isn't it, on a racetrack to beat the other guy with more mumbo. Just putting some numbers on this, okay? If you've got air compressed by a turbocharger on the way into an engine, let's say it's coming out of the intercooler at 60 degrees C, okay? There's that. If you can do some latent heat of vaporization, water evaporating applied science voodoo and suck out another 20 degrees C from that air, that's going to be about... Uh, 10% temperature reduction in terms of the absolute temperature, you know, with respect to absolute zero. So that should give you 10% more air in mass for any given volume, allowing you to burn 10% more fuel, and that will allow you to make 10% more power because these things are all more or less directly proportional. And this is why engines have mass airflow sensors, right? They're called MAF sensors. So they can tell the injectors how much fuel to deliver by measuring the mass of air going in. Therefore, water injection is a hack that allows you to pump up the mass of air going into the engine without any other substantial mechanical changes. So, how do you take advantage of this in practice, right? You could inject water into the inlet airway as suggested, and it would vaporize and increase the density of the air. And you'd need to manage that so it vaporized ahead of the MAF sensor, obviously, for maximum benefit. And you really would not want to deliver your water in some sort of unintended way if it malfunctions, right? Because if you tsunami the water in there by mistake, you could catastrophically destroy your engine because water is incompressible and if the piston hits it with the valves closed it's cats and dogs down there. A safer alternative is going to be on a turbocharged engine at least simply to spray water onto the exterior of the intercooler. Just increase the chill factor there and this is a dead easy modification. You just need a couple of garden irrigation sprayers from the hardware store. You get some matching tube, an old windscreen washer pump, you know, the motor from that and the tank possibly as well. Get it from a wrecker and a switch for the dashboard. Yes, something to do this Easter weekend in the garage, I think. Obviously, this works because that's basically what Subaru does on the most powerful WRX STI engine ever, the S209 model, right? That's the one that we don't get here in Schittsville. It's North America only. Subaru puts a 3.4 litre water tank in the boot and a paddle for the driver to activate the system behind the steering wheel, allowing the driver just to pump that and get the intercooler spray happening when a little extra urge is required. And the effect is pretty immediate and the engine adapts up in real time because it just keeps listening to what the MAF sensor has to say. It allows you to go really, really fast and hopefully not crash, which, last time I looked, was the whole point of motorsport. Before I let you go, some brief spiritual safer driving advice on the eve of Easter, the chocolate egg-laying rabbits, nutbag celebration of death and alleged resurrection of the alleged son of the fake Christian God. And this segment is inspired course by you. If I could be bothered, I could add the numerous times you refer to God, Jesus, religion, scomos, speaking in tongues, etc. Got an issue, John? On the issue of faith, religion, you have form. Wow, two exclamation marks. That's a hell of a shout, I'd suggest. Well, I am truly sorry about that, Robert. In mitigation, I can only tell you that I was lost then. But happily, now I'm found. So please forgive me. I have a new relationship with the Lord now because I have rekindled my faith. I was all alone back then and I was kind of done with Jesus and what I saw as his mystical malarkey. At that time, I, I needed someone new, someone more in line with my core values, someone I could authentically believe in. So you know who I worship now? Jack Bauer. 
Jack Bauer is, when you think about it, the perfect upgrade on Jesus. I actually worship Jack Bauer, Tony Almeida and Chloe O'Brien these days because, you know, the father, the son and the vaguely hot hacker. And frankly, I was okay with burning in hell before, provided I got to share a cell with Nina Myers. But I stayed strong and true. Yes. So, dear Jesus, on the day before Good Friday, it's been emotional, but I'm sad to say it's over. And it's not me. It's you. I've found someone else and we are happy. Jack Bauer takes zero shit and he's been resurrected nine times in in just 13 years. And on Fox, that's an eternity. He saved humanity every time too. Against incredible odds. A miracle every time. And you know, since I've been worshipping Jack Bauer, my prayers have been answered roughly the same number of times as when I worship the King of the Juice. So... There's been absolutely no downside for me there. And I find it easier to follow Jack Bauer's four commandments than the other guy's absurd and outdated ten. Summarised, of course, in the one-page Jack Bauer Bible entitled, appropriately enough, Get Jacked, the CTU Rules of Engagement for Life. Yes. Rule number one, don't complain to Jack. Don't come bitching to Jack. He's trying to save the world here. And I take that to mean your problems are petty, so just shut up and deal with them. Dear Jack, (coughs) my cock hasn't seen a chick for days. Please help. Jack doesn't want to know about that. I know it's petty. Number two, the boss, okay, he's generally a dick. And this doesn't matter. There's always a workaround and it's the work that matters. Not the asshole in charge. Jack taught me that. Number three, and in my view, this is the big one, get shit done. Nobody ever saved the world by sitting in a circle in some fucking yurt, holding hands and getting in touch with their friggin' feelings. Steely, unshakable resolve, bare knuckles, and of course, the Beretta M9 of destiny. Whatever it takes, just get shit done. Which leads us, of course, to number four, thou shalt not kill. Except, of course, the enemy. You can kill as many of those mother lovers as absolutely necessary to abide by your obligations vis-a-vis commandments one through three. And all I can tell you on this is it's working out okay so far. And one day, you know, before I die, if this continues, I hope to visit Washington, D.C. at Easter and check into a Motel 6 just down the road from CTU headquarters. Take a reverent stroll, procure from local merchants, perhaps a box of Oreos and a fifth of bourbon, and then kick back on a very good Friday indeed and enjoy the body and the blood of Jack Bauer himself. Hopefully watching some reruns of Baywatch. (laughs) That would make the afternoon just perfect. I think you'd agree. Just to cap off on all of this, you know, I might pause to ponder the quaint beliefs of those... Nutbag Catholics, inspired no doubt by their ridiculous red shoe wearing CEO in a dress. That's what he seems to like so much on formal occasions. I don't know why. So do enjoy your break, whatever your faith, and don't take it all too seriously. Chow down on some chocolate and, you know, think about losing weight next week. If you're driving anywhere, Drop back from the car in front, put both hands on the wheel at nine and three, obviously, unless you want to be a total loser. Pay attention and just drive like everyone else out there around you is out to get you. Monitor the situation for threats constantly. Be hypervigilant, maintain situational awareness, be ready at all times and keep checking your six. That's how Jack would do it. Peace be upon him and also upon you.